shortly. Uh, I think most of us are here now, so that's great. Um, I think there's still a few, correct, online? So a couple watching online. So if, if you are online and have any prayer requests or praises, send them in. Uh, for us in the room, we will share those here momentarily. As far as announcements, I guess just a reminder, if you saw the post, uh, when we are done recording here, when we're done with our service here, we'll say it that way. Um, hold on, my wife will finish up her, uh, what do you call it, post, 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 salute. post salute, and uh, then we'll have some quick announcements as well following the service. Um, but other than that, I don't know that we have any other specific announcements. Just good to have people here. I can say that. That's a, a huge blessing. Uh, but as far as some prayer requests, as far as some uh, what we have on our app, uh, I want to continue to pray for Emily. And uh, I'm not sure if that's still the right way to spell it. Is it? Where's this one we're going with this week anyway? So yeah. that's the, that's the this, week's version. This, this week's version. Um, and then obviously the cost of concern. So the time going. Mentioned things are a little uh, strange these days with that. Yeah, and children are under, they're stressed anyway, and they don't know how to cope. And, yes. Um, and damage people do damaging things. Yes. So. That, is, that is very true. Hannah, home, yeah, pregnancy, good. So praying for five people to be reached for each one of us individually in 2020. Uh, and that's Larry, Lonnie, and Ken. And Paul, all the healthies. I put on the app, but we got a good report on Lonnie Smith this week. That yes. He is feeling well, she said, strong, happy, and um, he's getting his strength back and his weight back. He's really positive. Yeah, very good. Very good. And other than that, she's doing chemo at home constantly, and she's having very bad side effects from it. So they're trying, they did a bunch of tests this week to see if they can bring the chemo down a little. Yes. She'll get those results next week, so. Good. Take a break for Adrian Turkey. As of last week sometime, during the week, uh, they were having riots in Turkey there because of what's going on here in the States. It's kind of crazy. But they did text them because they are affected by the possibility of root brutality here in the yeah. States. But they were having riots right there in front of the uh, embassy mm -hmm. consulate. Um, but it seems like things have, yeah, at this moment, have quieted down. down. And uh, so we continue to pray for Ryan as well. And uh, we don't have it on here, but it's the, the camps as well, Bible camps that um, certainly are usually in full swing by now. And uh, having to adjust all that and squeeze all the squeeze the summer into a half a summer now, and uh, just all the decisions and the steps that are taken. Um, I know there's a lot of questions still with the wild on, on who's doing what and how and uh, smaller staffs because they have smaller camp. They're bringing in less money because they have fewer weeks, but yet all the jobs still have to get done. Uh, but they can't afford to have the whole staff, so. Um, it will just be an interesting uh, summer for all the camps involved. Uh, the Wild obviously normally has 300 people on staff. Um, and so even at half capacity, that's still a large group of people doing work. Uh, smaller camps obviously don't you lose one person. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot of job to fill. Um, so we'll be praying for the camps as well. But did anything come in? Hey, good to go. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we, we do thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for, again, your constant mercy upon us. I do pray that you would certainly be with the requests that are on our screen, uh, the ones that are certainly on our hearts as well. Uh, I just ask that you be with Emmeline, certainly the, uh, the details you are aware of. Uh, but as she was just having another setback and back in the hospital and just figuring out what's going on, I just pray that you would uh, guide those as they are uh, doing tests and perhaps even have figured it out already as far as uh, I know, but certainly you are aware of all those details. I just pray that you would do a work in our hearts and as well in the family that surrounds her, at least from a distance at this point. We certainly do pray as well for this cost of concern, and certainly you are aware of all those details, and perhaps magnified a bit by all that's going on uh, today um, in our nation. I just pray that uh, you would just uh, calm 
some of the situation here in, in our states that you would uh, certainly work in hearts and lives that obviously that we need a revival. We need a, uh, our hearts, our minds, our eyes turned back to you. And I just pray that you would uh, just begin to work even in our hearts here this morning. Uh, that you challenge us and direct us accordingly. We certainly do pray for uh, the many on our list who are going through some medical needs, specifically cancer or uh, some other form of serious uh, medical needs right now. I just pray that you would give the grace, the patience, the endurance that is necessary through this, that to be able to uh, see you uh, through those situations. We do certainly do pray for the camps, uh, for the one here in our state, a uh, rather small camp, and trying to figure out how to get everything uh, orchestrated for the summer and all the details and the staffing and all that. I just pray that you would give direction and, and all the steps that are necessary and certainly for uh, the wilds are on the other end of the spectrum as, as uh, they have a lot of work to uh, be accomplished with a much smaller staff than normal. Uh, I just pray that you give them the energy, uh, certainly give them the uh, focus uh, that in the midst of the extra jobs, in the midst of the extra work here this summer, that they wouldn't lose sight of the hearts that are there as well. And I just pray that you'd be honored through that. And I just ask that you be with the other requests, certainly on our hearts and our, and our minds, perhaps ones that I'm overlooking, but you're certainly aware. I just pray that you would give us direction in our own lives, day after day, step after step, and that we live our lives that bring honor and glory to you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we do not have any uh, videos. We've pretty much caught up. Oh, we're still waiting for one from Reverend Bob, and um, hopefully we can get one from him here shortly. Um, but other than that, I don't imagine that Sherry Clark will give us anything. I don't know that she has all that capacity. We know she has guns. I don't know if she has capacity to get us a video. <laughs> um, and so we are at a standstill there. Uh, we have a couple of ideas. But anyway, this week we have none, but we do have a bunch of music. And I think only perhaps one of those as well. So that's it. Uh, which one goes first? 
Uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, we've done that job in the, the past, and it is it's work. It's tedious, yes. It's tedious work. And uh, I was very thankful when Joe offered to take that over, and very thankful that it's done. And so, uh, thank you guys there in the back row. And uh, I trust that your bones, your muscles, your fingers are all uh, <laughs> stuck together. Stuck together, <laughs> yeah, permanently. <laughs> yeah, permanently like this <laughs> this week. <laughs> Uh, but very thankful for that, and then as well, I know we don't have bulletins, but a number of uh, birthdays that have just happened. I believe that we've had the notice here, but we had uh, two boys had birthdays uh, the last week, yeah. the week before. And I think we got somebody else up here uh, has got a birthday here coming up shortly. And so I want to wish pretty much half of us today a happy birthday. <laughs> uh, so thankful for... Uh, just that life can be done, uh, even in the midst of all of the things that we're going through. When I was in college, um, was that the junior year, was that your senior year, that uh, Bob Loggins was president? The president that had been at the college where we were had resigned, and one of the vice presidents was uh, Bob Loggins, who's now been a pastor for many years, and had been before that. Uh, he became the interim president, and he would start every chapel message. Uh, quoting, I'm sure I've said it before, but he'd come, his first words as he walked up to the mic after all the singing and the introductions and the announcements, he'd walk up to the mic and his first words were, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's uh, rejoice and be glad in it. And every time he would do that, he would emphasize a different word. Sometimes it would be, This is the day that the Lord has made. And other days it would be, you know, whatever word it would be. Uh, well, I haven't done this every uh, Sunday, but I think just a, again, a great verse for us to begin with every week is Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. Even the God of our salvation, or again, Old Testament theology, not New Testament theology, the, our, the God of our deliverance. And uh, blessed be that God who daily loads us up uh, with numerous benefits. And we have to be able to see that. We want to go back to Exodus chapter 15 here this morning. As we continue living Christianity in, in quarantine, I'm glad it's beginning to open up a little more. Uh, Lord Holland is responding to our chaos. And uh, again, so this week after week, something started in Exodus. This isn't just about the coronavirus. It's not just about what's going on now in our state. This certainly is not just about here in uh, recent weeks uh, about all the protests and the riots and all of that. Um, but we know that there will continue to be as, as, as the sparks fly upward. Uh, we know that there are going to be trials for us. There are going to be situations that we're going to face collectively as a unit, uh, nationally as an entire nation, even globally. Uh, there's going to be things that we are going to be facing and we have to learn what it is that we are to be growing in and see those opportunities for growth. And uh, so we're kind of following briefly uh, during this time frame the children of Israel as they are learning lessons that many times we still have to learn today in, in regards to living out our Christianity even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of confusion, even in the midst of when things just don't seem to be going right. Before we dive into these next verses, let's give us a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for our time together, I just pray that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. I pray that the message would be clear to those that are in this room and those that are watching online and perhaps those that will be watching later. I just pray that we will be able to learn from your word, the truths that you have for our lives today, this moment, uh, that we might uh, be able to be more prepared perhaps for that next moment, that next trial, that next test. And uh, we thank you for what you will do and how you will do it. And I pray that you would allow us to have tender hearts as you do your work in us. And we thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. I already looked at uh, six points. We've gone kind of points two by two. This week, <laughs> I was telling my daughters, as, as you've heard this running commentary, my three points went down to two points, and then I think it was my sweet daughter back there in the corner that was complaining that my two points are still just as long or too long. Uh, so this week, I only have one point. <laughs> but three subpoints under it. So, um, But so far, we've got know the remedy, how, how do we handle our chaos? We need to know the remedy. We need to know what peace is. We, know, we need to know longevity. Sometimes it's easy to forget this. <laughs> this too shall pass. Uh, we need to know his presence. Uh, we need to know praise. 
and uh, we need to know trust. And uh, here this morning, we want to look at, we need to know the test. Uh, we need to know and realize that there are times that we are facing things in our life that are, are proving grounds for us. And uh, if we can see it that way, then maybe we can see more often or more clearly when we, can I use the word, when we fail the most proving grounds. When we, when we are struggling with that test. And to be able to have eyes that are tender enough and open enough to be able to realize, here I'm going through something that should be proving me, should be a, a, a presenting Christ in me, but I'm struggling with this. I, I'm not doing well. And, and that would be the opportunity then to maybe call up a, a brother or sister in Christ and say, hey, can you just pray for me? I'm struggling on this one. Uh, or spend time in God's words. We should always do this, but direct our hearts and our lives to his word and uh, find out what is it that I, I, I should be doing. Uh, I know I've announced not that long ago that I'm working on some classes here lately, and I'm so thankful that I finally finished one of my classes this last week. Big project. If you, if you want to read a 17-page report on the soteriological view of repentance and salvation, I've got a paper for you. <laughs> I, know, I know everybody's going to be running up to me afterwards to get that one. <laughs> what was that? It's a good, I like, my proofreader says it was a very good paper. Uh, but that was, this last uh, Saturday was the uh, project due date for my last class, so I got that last project done. And uh, 1,200 pages read and finished. And uh, now, actually, literally between now and Tuesday night, I have to take the midterm for this next class. And uh, I realize I'm too old for this. <laughs> <laughs> too, old, too old for this. This would have been so much better right out of college, I think. Uh, but anyway, we're pressing on. As I say to my family, one class down, ten more years to go. And uh, we'll see how that works. But in, in, in schooling, and I haven't specifically had this problem. Most of you know this, but in high school I went to a very small Christian school there in uh, Woodridge near Chicago. And I think there were, for most of the years, there were 12 of us in the high school. And uh, so... We couldn't get away with anything, and uh, we couldn't hide from anybody. Uh, it was 12 of us. We were all pretty much in the same room all the time, and same classes, and uh, this kind of a four-year rotation of all the classes, and, and uh, that's how life was in, in high school. First year of college, I went to Pensacola, which was huge compared to 12, <laughs> and uh, did get a little lost in the so many of the classes, especially freshman year. You have all those classes that are freshmen. Everybody, every freshman has to take. And uh, Pensacola is a huge campus, and uh, there'd be you know a class. I'm just one of 1,000 people in this class, and uh, you have to sit in this order in this huge rooms, and here's your seat. And uh, the only way that the teacher knew who you were, or whether or not you were there, was whether or not that seat was filled. Uh, you could hire your roommate to sit in that seat, but the teacher would never know. Not that that guy did that, but just say that could be a possibility. After my first year of college, then I transferred to uh, Maranatha, mostly because. Uh, my to be wife was at Mary Nassau Pensacola, and I had to get to the right college to get that rest of my life straightened out. And uh, so I went to uh, a Mary a much smaller campus. In fact, the entire campus when I went there was smaller than my freshman class at Pensacola. Uh, but still much bigger than the 12 that I had in high school. And uh, so, but in, in any school, we can all say this, we can all give testimony that in any school that you go to, at any level, there are different. How do you want to say this? I'm not trying not to be judgmental here, but there's different levels of, of teachers. Can you say it that way? There are going to be those teachers that are hard. There are going to be those that are easy. Sometimes the ones that are hard, you remember more from the class, and you remember more, and they often even cherish the teachers more. Uh, but there were teachers that were amazing. They could make the most boring topic exciting. And then there were teachers that were the complete opposite. They could make the most exciting topic dreadfully boring. And, and, and so you, you have those. And, and I found this illustration. I've never experienced something like this. Um, uh, but there was a, a, a student, in fact, that it was in Ohio State University. I don't know how long ago. But there was a, similar to what I was saying to Pensacola. There was a, a class. It was actually a calculus class with a 1,000 people in it. And the teacher was one of those teachers that really could care less about his students. Uh, he had no connection, no concern, no love. Just here I am, here's a Here's, here's the lesson, here's the test, you do your work, I'll do mine, 
we don't really have to have any kind of communication together. Well, it came down to the, the final uh, for this class, and a lot of students were struggling, and it came down to, I have to do well on this test, or I'm gonna be back here taking this dreadful class again. And uh, since calculus is a, a topic that not everybody loves, uh, there was great importance for this final. Well, this teacher was one of those teachers that would sound off the time. You know, you got 55 minutes or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Every five minutes, he'd holler out, 50 more minutes, 50 more minutes, 45 minutes, 40, which just, you know, it helps everybody that you get that along. I, I, th I do pretty well with tests. I, I mean, I'm not one that stresses out. I don't know people can get very stressful. And I had to take a few tests for insurance as far as uh, certifications. And uh, there's this place that I take some online, and when you take their final exam, there's a clock up in the corner, and it just ticks down. And I just find that so ever annoying because even though I'm, I'm you know, I'm gonna be done an hour ahead of time, you know, they give you so much time, I could run around too long between every question, but just having this clock tick down in the corner is, is irritating. I can't imagine every five minutes the teacher's announcing this. Well, it came time, he starts counting down by the minutes, 10 minutes, nine minutes, eight minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, counts down from the 10, nine, eight, seven, put your pencils down, come forward and drop your paper on the table. Thousand students immediately put their pencils down, stand up, and march to the front to put their paper, test paper on the, the table. I should say 999 students, because one remained sitting way back there in the class, sitting out with this test. The teacher kind of was puzzled as he just saw the kid up there continuing on. Finally, the thousand or the 999 other students walked past and leave their tests in a pile that became become more of a disaster. Walk out of the room and now it's just the teacher and this one student. Teacher surprised and says nothing, just waits. 20 minutes later, that student puts his pencil down and it has a big smile, gets his test, walks to the front, and uh, as he's about to put it in the pile, the teacher talks, stops him and says, wait, I'm out. You, you, you failed this test. You didn't get it done in the allotted time. You're done, you failed. You'll be back here next year. And the student, I'm, I'm not supporting this. This is not a, an idea for college girls. This is not how this should be done. But the student says, do you know who I am? And the teacher says, I don't care who you are. You weren't too long. You failed, and the, te and the student again says, well, let, let me rephrase. Do you know what my name is? The teacher again says, I don't care what your name is. I don't have a clue. I don't care, but I'll see you next year. And he said that, the student reached into the pile, picked up the top about 500, put his paper down, dropped the rest of them on top, and he says, I guess I passed. <laughs> well, uh, the teacher had no idea who he was, not any idea where his test is in that pile now. Again, yeah, not supporting that concept. You know, the reality of life is sometimes we live that way with our God. I can get faced by this chaos, I can get faced by this test, this proving ground, this opportunity that I have to come forward uh, shining for my Lord, and I can absolutely fail, completely and utterly fail, but God won't notice. God doesn't know who I am, God doesn't know my circumstance, God doesn't understand. And somehow we justify that in our minds as we look at our tests, as our proving times, as our schoolroom opportunities, and uh, convince ourselves that, you know, God, I, I can probably pull this one off on God. He won't notice. Well, you know, the reality is, is in uh, Exodus uh, chapter 15, God noticed. And, and the reality is in our own lives, uh, whatever it might be that we're facing, God notices whether it be our response in our own hearts to this event that's going on, as far as it is, I, I, it almost seems like uh, the coronavirus has lost the, uh, the news cycle. And I don't mind that, I guess. Um, but it, it could be that how we responded to that. God won't notice how I responded to that. How are we responding to the new circumstances that surround us? God won't notice. How we surround, how I respond to that next one? We almost think, you know, God won't notice this. Do we know, do we know the test? Do we know that what God is doing in our hearts and our lives through each moment? Obviously the answer is we don't always know. 
But are we aware that God is always doing something in our hearts and our lives and that every scenario, every situation is an opportunity for us to grow? Some of those situations are not fun. I Honestly, I'm not looking forward to this midterm test that I have. Again, I'm too old for this. And uh, I thought, really thought I was going to really enjoy this class, and I'm not. <laughs> I really, uh, I, a little back on uh, my first class, I really thought it was going to be, it was a required class, and uh, it was on uh, theology, doctrine. I thought, oh boy, but it's required. I'm going to get through this one, I'm going to struggle my way through it. And uh, I loved it. In fact, I hated to see it end. Kind of hated to put that last sentence on my final report, turn it in, and thought class is done. This class I thought was going to be really exciting. And this, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not. I'm not really enjoying this one. But you know, there are, are, are tests that we have that aren't going to be enjoyable. There are going to be times that life isn't offering fun. How are we responding when things aren't as fun? as we would like. Look at Exodus chapter 15. Let, in fact, let me read again the last verse of, of chapter 14. This is what we looked at last week. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So the last point from last week was no trust. And, and that last word there, they believed the Lord, and they believed in Moses as, as the servant of the Lord. And then we looked kind of the point out that our trust, we have to reevaluate our trust every time. Every day, every situation, am I still trusting in my God? I'm not talking about for salvation, but I'm talking in life. Are we still trusting him in this? We jumped to verse 22 last week. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now the point last week for that phrase in connection to the last verse of chapter 14 was, hey, they claim trust. They're seeing and dancing of the first part of verse of chapter 15, evidence their trust. But it was only, it literally could have been 30 hours later as far as they counted days back then. 30 hours later, suddenly they're no longer trusting. And they're doing that wonderful wine. What are we supposed to drink? We're thirsty. I understand, you've traveled even 30 hours of traveling, and you run out of water, you're longing for something to drink, you see water, and it's not drinkable. I, I understand it's what we would all probably do, but, but here's our, our pop quiz question, number one. What stops us? What is it that stops us? Again. 30 hours, I'm just using, I don't know how long ago it was, but that sounds like a good round number. 30 hours ago, they were singing and they were dancing and they were celebrating all that God had done for them and they were even claiming victory for the future, far future, because they were so confident in who God was. 30 hours later, you can almost have that, that screeching, you know, the record kind of, and, and 30 hours later, it's, where did that go? Where did the rejoicing? Uh, here we are on unstoppable. In the in fact, I have a number of verses here. We can get these as well there, Rebecca. Exodus chapter 15. This is in their song. Just, just imagine if you could say all these confidently and sing them. You're, they're singing this, not because this was a rehearsed, already known song. This was, like I said last week, this was not Amazing Grace to them. This was not, all right, everybody, let's sing the first and last verse of Amazing Grace. You all know it, let's just sing it again. They are making this song up as they're going in great poetry, but they're singing it. It's coming from their hearts. It's not just something somebody else wrote and they're singing. This is from their hearts. Notice what comes from their hearts. Verse 2, the Lord is my strength. Continue on. He has become my, again, salvation, or deliverer. The Lord is a man of war. Verse 6, thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. I know this is singing. You don't want me to sing this. Continue on. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces our enemies. Verse 7. In the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown. Verse 10. Even acknowledging the reality of God's power over, over creation, thou didst blow with thy wind. And verse 11 asks this question, and, and they have already proven the answer. Who is like 
unto you. And, and the answer that they've already proven is, is there is none like unto you. Uh, uh, there is none that we need to be, be afraid of. Literally, if, if, we could, uh, uh, if we could understand what is taking place in chapter 15, it is this. And, and again, I'm not trying to make any recommendations of movies here. But we literally have in these first about 21 verses of chapter 15, we have the uh, a, a crazy Italian boxer running up the steps doing his, yes! And, and this is a, we are unstoppable because of our God. And then if you could envision the, 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 the rocky scenario, he's just run up from the 76 steps. My wife lets me run up those same steps uh, when she was in college. Uh, they're in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, right up the stone steps, and there's a little statue monument of, of, of Rocky, and I think there's probably a picture of her uh, next to Rocky. Uh, they're on the steps. You know that 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 is an art museum. It's an art museum. It's probably the only art museum that millions flock to every year. They don't go inside, but they go to the art museum year after year. They climb the steps and pose next to, to Rocky. Well, can you imagine in that moment, and I, I don't even recall what happens next in the movie, but I, I recall that, and you know, if Becca had the means and ability for the watch that line, she'd be putting a little Rocky music going on in the background. And, and uh, you, you understand what's taking place in the first part of chapter 15. But here's what happens as we reach to these next verses. Rocky reaches over to get this bottle of water that I'm sure whomever his trainer was has with him. And uh, he, he pulls it out, and it is grapefruit juice. I'm teasing Josiah about grapefruit juice. It is something that is awfully bitter and sour. And woo It's something that you're not going to want to drink when you're so thirsty, when you've just accomplished his run and his exercise and his 76 steps and his rawr at the top. And, and uh, we're ready for a, a, a great, wonderful glass of water. And it is something that is sour. It's something that is bitter. It's something that isn't right. It says, and when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the water of the Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured. What is it that stops us? What is it that we claim as our so-called so bitter water? You know, all of us are going to be facing bitter water at our times in our life. Each one of us are going to be facing things in our scenario, in our life, in in our journey that are no different than what they're going through right here. We have our our uh, top of the flight of steps victory moments. We are unstoppable. And almost immediately thereafter, we have the moments where we are reminded that we actually are stoppable. It is God, our God, who is unstoppable. And we have a taste of some bitter waters. What is it? That makes us, that causes us to stop. Interesting in the Old Testament for, uh, if you recall, part of the uh, the justice system of sorts uh, in the time frame of, of this, well, I should say a little thereafter, um, if a woman was suspected of, of cheating on her husband in order to he was given bitter water, and uh, if she was able to drink the bitter water and have no effects, she was considered innocent. She drank the bitter water, and, and I kid you not, this is what it says. She drank the bitter water, and her stomach bloated, and her thighs rotted. And I, that's not a picture that I want to have in my mind. For, if her stomach bloats, and her thighs rot, she is declared guilty and forever judged. Obviously, she lives with the continued judgment of that. The Bible doesn't speak highly of, of bitter water at times. But we know here in a moment that our Lord allowed bitter water in their lives as a proving ground for them. And we know that there are times in our life that God allows bitter waters in our hearts and our lives to see, to show us, that Paul said he already knows, to show us what's in our heart. How do we respond to bitter water? Pop quiz number one, what's going to stop us? What, what keeps us from that God is unstoppable. God is amazing. The, that very last screen I had up there. The Lord is my strength. He's my deliverer. He's a man of war. He is glorious in power. He has dashed pieces. He has dashed in pieces of the enemy. His greatness and the excellency. It's, it's amazing. It's overwhelming. 
Even you have the power of creation itself and can do your work and your will in ways that I can't even imagine. There is no one like you, God. And then we take that very next sip of what we thought was going to be pleasant water and it's bitter and it stops us in our tracks from that. And our words go from this to, God, why have you allowed this in my life? God, why is this happening to me? God, why, why do I have to face this circumstance? Our bitter one. What is it? Number one, what is it that stops us? But things get a little, little dicier here as we move to the second pop quiz question. What moves you? In other words, what gets us back up on our feet? Now, to go back to the first question, I think there's a lot of people today within Christianity that even tried ministry. It, it, it was bitter. It didn't work. It wasn't what they thought it was. And done. There are a lot of people that have tried this, they tried this, and uh, it hasn't been the results that they thought or they hoped for, they assumed. And uh, they kind of put their hands up and said, I'm not doing that again. I'm not, I'm not trying that again. Well, the pop quiz question number two is, what's going to get us up and going again? What's going to get us moving again? What is it that is going to have to happen for us to say, Lord, I will still trust you. We'll all have those bitter moments, and many of us will probably, in those bitter, water moments, will stop. We'll go from praising our God to doubting our God. Unfortunately, that, unfortunately many times it's human nature. It's not right. It's still sin, but it's what we do. But the question would be for the second, what gets us to say, all right, I'm a sinner. I sit before you, my, my God, in, in doubting and complaining and murmuring, and I will trust you. Look what happens in these next verses. The people murmured, verse 24, against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. I'm going to stop right there. We all have to admit that there are things in our life that motivate us, right? Uh, we do a uh, we do some cleaning at, at the agency here on the weekends as a kind of a, an extra job, and uh, all of us do it. We kind of all split the money so that the, even Josiah gets a little bit of money uh, out of it, and so we every weekend. But it's one of those things that doesn't take us very long, and it's not hard work. It's just you know you got your weekend, and especially now I'm working on classes, and I've got midterm I've got to study for this afternoon, and it, it winds up being one of those things of, uh, oh, I want to have to go back. Especially now that I'm back in the office and working from home, I want to have to go back to the office on a Saturday, or on a Sunday, or whenever it is, and clean. I don't, I don't want to have to do that. And I don't think the kids are always that excited about doing it either. So if we're sitting, you know, sitting in the air conditioning, and I say, you know what, we really got to go, we, we got to get this cleaning done. I'm not going to say that they're whining and complaining and murmuring, but I can tell by their movements that this isn't fun, Dad. This isn't what we. This isn't how we thought we would like to spend the weekend. Now, on the other hand, if I said, you know, if we're all kind of being lazy, join the air conditioning, and I said these words, who wants to go get some ice cream? Which one do you think is more motivating? Dad, do we have to get ice cream? It's so comfortable here on the couch. Dad, we don't. Have, then we have to go outside. We gotta find our shoes. Uh, oh, Dad. No, I say, who wants to go get some ice cream? They, they, them and the dog. Dog has no idea, but he senses their excitement. He's all excited. He's jumping up and down. He's running. I'm like, no ice cream for the dog. You're staying home. But there's excitement, and, and I'm the one that's on the last one out of the van, and they're waiting. Come on, Dad. Let's go, up, Dad. Hey, who wants to go clean the office? Can we get this done first? Can we just watch this next show? Can we, can we uh, play outside? Can we go swimming in the pool first? Yeah, can we do? What motivates us? We know that there's something that always motivates us. What is it that motivates us? Look what happens here. The people have murmured. What has, what has Moses done? He's done exactly what we all should be doing. What does Moses do there in uh, verse 25? He goes to the Lord. That's where we ought to go when we face those bitter water moments. It, our, our responsibility isn't just murmur and a complaint. Our responsibility is let's go to the Lord. This could be an opportunity that I need to spend some time with him so that I can learn what I'm supposed to be learning from this. So I can grow in the way that he has for me for this. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast into the waters, the waters remained sweet. 
there he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And notice this phrase, and there he, what? Tested or proved them. The very next verse is going to go into what that, that the testing is, what the proving is. But, but let me just stop right here. You, you've gone, have you ever been really thirsty? You've just been dying of, I'm not, a, I'm not normally a, a person who drinks a lot of water. Now, when I'm really thirsty, I, I do enjoy water. And uh, certainly when we were working on the roof, my wife couldn't bring me enough water. I'm like, oh, i got to have more water. <laughs> I'm, I'm sweating so much from several years ago. It was hot. We picked the hottest we could do that. And uh, I was dying on the roof. And literally, I told my wife, I think at one point, every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, you got to bring me another glass because I'm dying up here. So every 10 minutes, you bring me another glass of water. Uh, that's keep me hydrated because I think I was, I was sweating three glasses of water every 10 minutes. And, and so... There are times that there's nothing better, in my opinion, than water. There are other times that my wife will say, hey, you want a glass of water? Ah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. You know, I don't need that water. But have you ever had something in your mouth that is just that, it's just not a good taste? Now, don't point to your spouse if it was something that they made. But you, you have all had that, or it just wasn't... It's not nice. It's not good. It wasn't. It wasn't proper. It was. It was wrong. Something was awry, and now you got that. When you're home, you can always run into the bathroom, brush your teeth. That takes care of a lot of that in your mouth. But but imagine being in the middle of the wilderness, and uh, you finally see water. So let's step into the shoes. You finally see water. Your mouth is dry. You sweated as much as you can sweat. They're in the wilderness. They're in the desert. They see water, they go up. Now, obviously, not all one million of them are doing this, because certainly not all one million of them could get to the water all at the same time. But you have a large group of people rushing to the water. They cut their hands in the water. They splash it in their face, drinking it as fast, because they are dying of thirst. And they, hit, they get faced with that, oh, the most awful taste. Undoubtedly, and I know this for a fact, because I spent 10 years in an ambulance, and I know this is fact. There's going to be those with very weak, how do you say it, constitutions? <laughs> And there's like, out of, well, for the sake of numbers, 100 people tried the water. There's probably 30 of them puking now because of that water. There's just going to be always that group. Something they didn't like the taste of, now they're getting rid of everything that's in their body. The rest of them, they're, they're like spitting. I'm not going to do that because we're told we're not supposed to be doing that kind of thing anymore. <laughs> but they're spitting, and, and they're, yeah, yeah. They have nothing to get that taste out of their mouth. They complained to Moses. Let's, we're staying in their shoes. We read this. We know it. It's Old Testament narrative. But step into their shoes. We complain to Moses and say, we, this is unacceptable. We can't drink this water, and we're going to die without water. This is unacceptable. And we see Moses go off and speak to who, whom we know, because we've seen him do this before. We go and see him speaking to his God. What is God going to do? Picture this in, my, in your minds. You see the man of God going off and praying to his Lord, and then you see the same man of God going and finding a tree and knocking it over. And then you see him throwing that tree, a tree. You see him throwing a tree or a bush of some sort into the water, and then you hear him say these words, all right, now try it. You know, we just read those verses, we read it, we've heard it before. And you just continue on with the next verse. But stop there in a moment. You are still spitting out the nastiest taste you've ever tasted in your life. And you've complained about it. The man of God has gone and he's come up with a solution from God. He throws a tree into the water. And he says, go ahead, try it now. Oh. You know, in a way that's gone humorous. But in a way, moms have been doing this since the beginning of time. Moms put that hot dog on them and some chips. And then they got to put beans. Oh, this is going to be good for you. No. You were right. You were good for me when you had the hot dog and the potato chips. Then you had to throw in the tree into the water. <laughs> yeah, threw the tree into the water. Here's, here's Moses. He's throwing the tree in the water. There's somebody that's still spitting the taste out of his mouth, and he's watching like, what did he just do? Why is he doing this? Let me ask you this. Who's going to go try that water now? <laughs> if it's me, I'm saying, no thanks. Because throwing a tree into the water is not going to make it better. It's going to make it worse. 
Now, I know scientifically that there are differences in trees. Like, for instance, I know that uh, uh, pine trees are very high in acid, and other trees are, are more on the, the pH scale, much, more, much different than, than the acids. And so, and I know that there's a way that you can balance, I, know, I remember this from high school chemistry or whatever that is, my daughter should be given this, where you can begin to balance out uh, whether it be a base or an acid, you get it back so it's, it's uh, what's that, neutral, whatever that, is it neutral, whatever, whatever the, the zero number is. So you can get it from a plus or a negative dot back to, to zero. And, and I know that there's ways, the plant farmers do it all the time. Lime is one of the ways that they get their, their soil in this area to get back to where it needs to be, to maybe not zero, but to, to the right number for, for the, whatever crop they're going to be planting. So I know that that is the case. They probably don't know that. But I also know, uh, let, me, let me remind you of two things. Number one, they have just come from Egypt where the water of the Nile was the most amazing water and the, fer the fertile area that they lived in, they knew what good water was. We came from Wisconsin before coming here to Tulane. They have a great water in Wisconsin. This is in the places we live. We came to Tulane, this was before RO. It was the most disgusting water I have ever tasted in my life. Now, the parsonage had been empty for a year and a half. So imagine a year and a half of water sitting in, in a water heater, and a year and a half of water just sitting in the lines. When we turned on the water, it smelled like rotten eggs from the 70s. The entire house reeked from the water. And I can honestly tell you, when they put in the RO and the Mike Richardson was alive, and uh, I think he actually came here to this church, visited shortly thereafter, and he says, oh, the water is so much better now. You know what my response was? Sticking with bottled water. <laughs> nah, no, not, not going to do that. They come from a background where they know where water is good. They have just tasted the most horrid thing they could ever imagine in their lives. The solution has been the man of God has thrown a tree into the water, and has said, all right, now drink of it. I would have to say that they're not likely, if it were us, if it were me, to jump up and say, oh, good, now it's fixed. <laughs> but as well, let me remind you of something else. Today, you can still go to the area that they assume was their route, and there, I think uh, what I was reading was there's three pools of water that are still bitter as bitter can be. In fact, if you're traveling in that area, you cannot stop and drink from that water because it is still bitter. If it were possible to use a local tree to balance out that water, would that make it acid? Would it be acidic if it's bitter? I don't know. Well, let's pretend that's what it is. My, my science teacher is, is uh, upset with me probably right now. But let's just say if it's, if it's an acidic water that's making it bitter, that, that if there was a tree that could balance that out, Certainly, by now, they would have figured that out. But it's still bitter today. I, I, I'm just pointing this out. There's a lot of things that we can excuse with science, where we can explain with science. There's a lot of things that we can justify with science. A lot of things that science can say, yes, this is how this works. Our bodies are amazing. Uh, Michael, what all that he went through, that's amazing with science and medicine and all that they can do. Phenomenal. What, what, what can be done? Because they figured out how this all works and, and, and all those details. But there are still things about what our God does that can't be explained by science. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 makes it very clear that, that uh, there's a lot about God that you'll never know while you're here on this earth. And there's a moment right here that this is all God. Because if it was just science, if it was just nature, if it was just trying to figure out the balance of, of the levels of the water by throwing in some sort of uh, plant life, uh, it would have been done, and in the middle of an area that needs water today, they would be able to use that water today, but they can't. Let me ask you some simple questions. Does God not still give us bitter waters today and resolve those by very, can I use the word odd? And I'm, not, I'm not casting judgment on my like God, obviously. But in human terms, does he not give us odd solutions at times in our minds? Here's a situation. Here's what you need to do. And we say, now that doesn't make sense. Let me give you some ideas. Uh, 
They're having problems. Uh, you know, a lady, my wife, was having problems in the marriage. Lots of bitter water. What is, what is God's solution? What is God's tree in the water? Submit to your husband. That doesn't make sense. I have a problem with this guy. Why am I going to submit to him? We've tasted the water. It's bitter. And God says, let me throw a tree in it and now try it. I can tell you what happens. There's a lot of ladies today that say, that's nonsense. That's insane. That doesn't work for me. Here's my situation. Can't do it. Won't work. Won't happen. God says, here's the scenario. Here's the answer. Now try it. And the answer today is, nope. Not today. Men, same scenario. Because if there's a marriage problem, it's probably both of us involved. Same problem. You're having a problem with your wife. What does God say you're supposed to do? Love your wife. A lot of guys say, I tried that once. <laughs> it doesn't work. She doesn't want to be loved. Whatever our excuse is. What does God say? Here's your scenario. Here's your bitter water. Here's the answer. Let me throw a tree into your water. And our minds say, that doesn't make sense. I can't do it. That doesn't work. Children, have your problem with your parents. What does God say? Obey your No, I tried that before. That just doesn't work to my benefit. God throws a tree into the water and says, now try it. And what do children all over the world say? Nope, not today. Having problems at work, what does God say? What do we say? Mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think that's going to work in my case. So here we are standing in the shoes of the children of Israel, and God says, all right, here's the answer. I'm going to throw a tree into the water. I've got to think there were people that were literally went from scoffing to laughing. The guy that is leading us to a land we've never been to has absolutely lost his mind. He has just thrown a tree into the water, and now he expects us to drink of it. The guy has lost his mind. The heat has gotten to him as well. What in the world are we supposed to do? Now, I would dare, we don't have a recorder for us, but I would dare say as a leader, Moses was the first one on the beach finding the water. I, I would guess that. We're not told that. But I would dare say that it would have been a tremendous test for the first, first person to try the water because that makes no sense. Bitter water will always be bitter water. It certainly will never be sweet water, especially not for throwing a tree into it. There are things, there are tastes in our mouth that are really hard to get rid of. And God has already given us a solution. But our lack of faith keeps us from enjoying that solution. Kind of a, a rough illustration from, from work in our mail room. Obviously, we have a mail postage machine for all of our mail. Each one of us throughout the day gets mail, and then we go down and we type in our information into the postage machine, and, and it prints a little postage on it. And so we have all, everybody in the office typing the same thing. So there's specific things you're supposed to wipe every time. You know, everybody uses it, wipe it down, and then there's hand sanitizer. You know, do it yourself as well. Well, I don't. I could, if I remember later today, I'm gonna take a picture and post it. There's hand sanitizer in our mail room that is the worst smelling. I, I, you know, hand sanitizer sometimes just just has a medicinal smell to it. Some of it has, you know, you go to uh, a bath and body works. Some pretty good smelling. They've even got some, some guy hand sanitizer that smells like cologne. It's like, <laughs> you know, diesel smell. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, this stuff is the nasty. I don't know what is wrong. I, 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 I've lost, one of the times I did it, I, I, I wiped everything down and then, and then you're like, what is this? What's this? Oh, oh, wow. And then you go upstairs, back up to our, our restroom upstairs, and I'm washing my hands and watching. Oh, and you wash some more. It doesn't come off. I like the stain for the ramp. It doesn't come off. And, and, and uh, I've actually gone to my office and used, you know, just a regular Corral hands and, and pump that up, and I'm literally dripping with it. I'm like, this stuff reeks. So last week, the kids came up. Were the girls, were you guys there too? No, it was just you two. These two came up and uh, just highlighted how it was the mail, so he did it. And then uh, a Jen, 
I'm not even thinking. I'm finishing up the male stuff. She puts it on her hands. She doesn't say a word. Josiah puts it on his hands. He doesn't say a word. And I'm not even thinking. I just put some. I'm like, oh, I didn't just do that. And about the time I realize, Jen says, what is that smell? Yeah, all of us. <laughs> We've all been. You know what I'm going to dare say? I'm, I'll probably forget this at some point. I don't ever want to use that again. That is, I smell bad stuff. I don't know what happened to this. This is, this is the worst that I have ever in my life smelled. It is horrid. Nasty. Like, dump diesel on my hands because that will improve the stench that is going on right here. It is horrible. God says, hey, you've got this taste in your mouth. It's not good. You don't like it. It's not enjoyable. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to throw some trees in the water and trust me. And time and time and time again, still today with our New Testament uh, uh, reality of life, we still say, nope, I can't. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. I'm not putting my hands down into that water again. I'm not putting it back up to my face. I can't do that. What stops you? What moves you? This last point, and I said I had three points, this was pretty much the same, but kind of goes one step further in these next verses. What, what directs us? Let me, let me continue on verse 26. Here's the proof. Here's the test. Here, here's what God has established. Here, let me put it this way. Here is why God allowed bitter water in their journey and then solved it with a tree. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases or, or plagues that they have just seen, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. If you will obey me, if you will trust me, if you will follow me, if you will just do... There I have the four things, the four things right there. If you will diligently hearken unto my voice, if you will do what is right, this is God speaking, what is right in my eyes, if you will give ear to my commands, and if you will keep all of my statutes, if you will do those things, I will, uh, let me kind of fill in the blanks here, I will always turn bitter water to sweet for you. If you will do those things. Now this is not a uh, prosperity message. It's not a trust God and go make me three times richer in three days. That, that is not what is being said here at all. But what, well, ultimately, to use my same illustration, is like, I've thrown the tree into the water. God says, if you just trust me and try my way, I will turn that bitter water into sweet. It's going to probably be a rough road. Do some of that. You're going to have to learn. He's going to have to learn. But I'll, I'll do that. Husbands, same scenario. Children, same scenario. Employers, employees, all same scenario. If you will trust me and follow the way that I have said, I will continue to keep you. I will continue to heal you. I will continue to turn bitter water into sweet water. Your journey is still going to be through the wilderness. Your journey is still going to be tough. There are still going to be times when you're going to hit that first gulp of water, and it's going to be, oh, nasty. But what will direct us? What leads us? What, what, what follows us? I know that there are a lot of problems in our life with bitter water because we choose instead to follow the recommendations of others. We choose to follow the counsel of others. We choose to, and ultimately what we are doing is we choose to disobey God because we like their idea better. What is God saying? Ultimately, as, as the proverb says, trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct that path. Bitter water resolved with a tree. It's like making a uh, uh, now, I do like broccoli, especially with cheese on the top of it. <laughs> but it's like taking a steak meal, putting broccoli next to it. <laughs> you're taking something that should have been, and you're going to fix it. And, and you know, that, that, that doesn't fix things. That, that's going to make it worse, Moses. What are you doing? He fixed bitter water with a tree and says, now try it. 
our minds are going to say, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't compute, we can't, that's not going to work. My situation is an excuse for that. There's a reasoning, I can justify it. Here's my scenario. I can't do what God tells me to do because, and we convince all of our friends that our because is because enough. God says, if you will just trust me, not them, not all the advice of your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors, why don't you just trust me? Why don't you just come to me and follow me? I know throwing a tree in the water makes no sense. But it is not sweet water. Look at what the last verse says. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water and three score seventy palm trees. Don't get excited, Katie. These are not the same palm trees that you think of in the coast. Seventy palm trees. And they encamped there by the water. Now, I'm not going to say that, you know, when life gives you a lemon, burn it in the lemonade. I'm not, I'm not going to say that uh, God is always going to bring us to this to a limb after Mara. But I'm going to say that our God is a faithful God. And he allows situations in our life to prove us, to test, to show us. When David said, search me, O God, and try me, see if there be any wicked way in me, he, didn't, he wasn't giving God permission to investigate. He was giving God permission to say, show me. Show me where I'm falling. Show me where I'm failing. Show me. Prove me. Test me. And that's literally what we are doing with our lives. We're facing the circumstance of COVID-19. Lord, test me. Where am I, where am I failing in my response here? What, you're throwing a tree into some bitter water, and I'm having a hard time trusting you in this. Marriage problem, work problem, neighbor problem, you, the list goes on. Lord, here's what you call me to do, and I've already justified why I can't do it. Here's the reality of it. Verse 27 came after verse 23. Finding this place of 10 well, or 12 wells, I think those numbers are significant, 12 wells and 70 palm trees, came after they arrived. Mara. They had to go through Mara first. Sometimes we would like to just have the good ones in our life, do we not? Lord, if you just give me all the good times and get rid of all the bad times, that would be a great kind of life to live. A lot of these are signs that we need to mar us to remind us to trust our God with a treat. Let's pray. So we thank you again for your word. I thank you for the example of the Israelite nation. I thank you for the very reality how your word gives us all that we need for our life and our godliness today. Thank you that you are a God that cannot be explained by science, that you are a God that is so far beyond our imagination, that your ways are definitely not our ways and your thoughts are far above our thoughts. I pray that as we go through life, through circumstances, through the chaos that we're living through right now, and undoubtedly, if you carry, and we do as well, what we will face yet in our future. I pray that we be able to follow after you in obedience, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when our mind says, this doesn't compute, this doesn't seem to add up, this won't work. I pray that we be able to trust you and go right back to the water and find it sweet. As we follow in obedience to you. I pray that you challenge our hearts, our lives, our steps as we move forward. In Jesus' name.